Father in heaven, thank you so much for this community. Thank you for Mark. Thank you for Lane and for Sertia and for the gift that they've been um, to us and the way that they have led us towards you. Father, we are um, excited about what you're doing here and we're excited about the way that you're moving in our life. But in the moment, in the present, as we're here, we have to acknowledge, um, Father, that we're in different places, that some of us, as I said, are excited, but some of us are still trying to figure out faith. Some of us aren't even sure that you exist. Some of us feel just like even though we're here, we don't belong. There's a lot of different things, but we're here. And so we ask Jesus that you would um, honor our seeking of you and that you would find us and that you would speak truth to us and that you would give us courage to believe that and that you would help us move out into the community with hope and with joy, and with an understanding of how much you love us. I ask that in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. We are in a series that's a series of unfortunate events. Um, and so it's just a three-week series of, an un- of unfortunate events. And that's good, because when you're talking about unfortunate events, um, you only want it to be short. So you don't want a lot of unfortunate events to be happening. But The last two weeks, we talked about a few, and one was sadness, the other was depression, one was loss, and we talked about fear, and really, we talked about how these all sort of apply to grief. And what we said in the last two weeks is, we're not going to help you get a grasp on sadness and depression and loss, fear and grief, like we're not going to just be get you to to just have it all wrapped up in a bow and and know how to deal with it. What we can do is talk about these things that are really integrated into one another. And as they're integrated into one another, um, we can give you maybe some tools, some things to, to hold on to as you wrestle with your own depression, as you enter into loss in your life and sadness, as you find yourself in the process of grieving, give you a couple of those things. Now, Tonight, um, we are going to finish up this series, and we're going to look at a passage in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. Now, what I would like you to do is, if you are one of those phone people, that you go look up Isaiah 61 and hold it in front of you. If you are um, someone who loves to hold that Bible in front of you, Isaiah happens to be a really, really, really big book. So you can just open your Bible in the middle, and nine times out of ten, you're going to find Isaiah. Um, You may even find Isaiah 61. I opened it, and I got to Isaiah 59. So what I'm going to do is you hold these in front of you, or and if you just don't want to, like having the text in front of you is not a big deal. That's okay. Um, But I'm not going to address this passage after I've read it in the sense that I'm not going to go back and read it. I'm just going to be talking about it, so I want you to have it in front of you. So Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah is an ancient prophet in the Old Testament. Okay, And this particular passage is him speaking about a future event, a, a, a Messiah, someone who is going to rescue Israel and take them out of captivity and deliver them permanently. And it says this, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. What I want you to hold on to today, and what I want you to think about, is this idea that you heard me talk about healing And healing being the thing that we as people are moving into. That Jesus is at the center of healing. And that's what we're called to do, is move into relationship with Jesus and experience healing, a wholeness, you might say. I want to argue to you, or suggest, or any other kind of way of thinking, that the key to healing is the favor of God and the vengeance of God. 
that the key to healing is you understanding and experiencing and being able to apply the favor of God. Healing has to go through God's favor. But not only does healing have to go through God's favor, healing has to go through God's vengeance. And the only way for you and I to truly find healing, to, to feel, begin to, to experience wholeness, we have to understand God's vengeance, and we have to grapple with God's vengeance, and we have to respond to God's vengeance. Okay? So you could sum it up as just very simple. For us to step into healing, we must wrestle and experience the favor of God, and we must wrestle and experience the vengeance of God. We must come to terms with those concepts, those ideas, and how they apply to us as we pursue Jesus and try to understand who he is. Now, I'd like to to talk to you about the Apostle Paul for just one moment. In the book of Ephesians, now the book of Ephesians is in the New Testament. So Isaiah, ancient prophet, Paul, Ephesians, New Testament. Ephesians is a letter from Paul who happened to be an apostle, right? Remember, an apostle, we got our sign, um, of Jesus. Now he was kind of late. He was the last apostle in that process. But every year or so, he would write a letter, and this one's to the Ephesians. And in chapter 2, verse 10, um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase this because I'm going to work out of three different translations. But basically what Paul says in this verse, chapter 2, verse 10, is he says that you and I are God's workmanship. Right? So he says you and I are, are people who have been crafted in a particular way to offer particular things. Like none of us are the same. We are God's workmanship created to do good works in Christ Jesus. That that what we've been created and crafted to do is good works. And we're created in Christ Jesus. So there's an assumption here in this that you are in Christ Jesus. Okay, so to be in Christ Jesus, to really fully connect to the idea of being God's workmanship, you have to be someone who says, I believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man, and he lived out a life that I could not live, and died a death I could not die. He died for my sins and that he rose from the dead, and that he is my king. Like that process, you have to step into that. And when you do that, you are created to do good works in Christ Jesus. And it says, it goes on to basically say, that these good works are prepared beforehand for you, for us to do. Okay. Other translations say they are preordained for us to live in or walk in. All right. Now you might say, why is this Minecraft picture up here with the word the colony. Well, here's the thing about this preordained thing. You and I get caught up in this all the time. Because we're like, oh, okay, so we read this passage, and maybe what he's meaning, because we forget the good works part, is that he's ordained that Eric will wear a black shirt and jeans and flip-flops. And he's ordained that I'm going to tie my shoes, and he's ordained everything because he knows everything. And so all I am is some kind of strange robot with very little free choice because God's kind of already figured it out for us. But this word preordained, or this word prepared for us, is the word where we get colony from, right? Or to colonize, or to establish a colony, okay? And so the idea here is that God has built something for us. So the best way to think about it is this. God has built you a house, right? He's built you a beautiful yard, and he's put plants and trees in it. When you go into your new house and you go into the bathroom and you shut the door, you are, he has prepared some works for you. You can either go to the bathroom, you can wash your hands, or you can take a shower, or you can do all three, but those are prepared works for you. He put together a bathtub, a sink, and a toilet. These are prepared works. Outside, there are trees to be watered. These are all good works. This is the metaphor. It's not that God has ordained me to tie my shoes. It's that God has laid out a city a colony, a home, and invited us to be part of it. Now, what's cool about the book of Ephesians, just as a side note, is the book of Ephesians is the walking book, right? So if you go into the King James, which is, does it much better, even when it comes to the Greek, it, it says that these preordained things are for us to walk in. And then the rest of Ephesians, after chapter 2, is to walk, walk in this, walk in this, walk in this. Don't walk in the way of the Gentiles. 
So in some ways you could imagine that what Paul is saying is that there is a way to walk with God in his village, his home, his place, and he's inviting us into that. And there is a way for the Gentiles to walk, the pe- people walking in darkness and given to drunkenness. Right? He goes on and describes what one way of walking, the other way of walking. Right? So Jesus has established in some ways this metaphoric home for us by all of the good works that he's done that he's invited us to do. Now here's the exciting part of all of this, and we'll get to, ah, I knew it, it's going to pause on me, it just does it. I got here this morning, and the computer had crashed. It crashes on Sundays. I believe that there's an update that continually crashes every Sunday. And it, so those of you who are good with computers, I forgot to make this announcement, I need some help with the computer to figure out why it keeps crashing. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll move away from that. Revolution. I want to talk about revolution because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 is about a revolution. But the revolution is started by Jesus. Um, when I was a kid, uh, particularly when I was in the 7th and 8th grade, I lived in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, there's like this, like everything is sand, at least where I was. I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And so you can dig really deep holes and put wood over them and you can make underground forts. So I had two brothers and... You know, that time in my life, like I said earlier, they were kind of like my kids. And so I, I like this idea of revolution. So I was going to train them to be, you know, part of the revolution. So I would make them, you know, climb the fence and crawl on the ground and shoot, you know, at the fake targets and duct tape them to the um, bunk beds, you know, and see if they could get out just to practice if they were captured. Um, and I was tired of them, right? So this is... I, I, but I like the idea of revolution, right? We like revolution in the sense that we feel like we need one all the time. Like things in the world are never going the way that we think they should, and we should have some kind of revolution in the sense of when you think of a revolution as an alternative way. So I want to go back a little to when Karen read Luke chapter 4. Because in Luke chapter 4, And every time you read Luke chapter 4, I want you to think about this. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 18, is when the revolution began. It began at this moment, and it is a most powerful moment next to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so what happens is is that Jesus walks into his hometown, and they hand him a scroll, and it just happens to be Isaiah. right? And he doesn't get, like us, to have the chapter and verse. So he kind of reads down until he finds the place he wants, and he reads this. And he says, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord. And he stops at the year of the Lord's favor, that I am to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, guess what the year of the Lord's favor is? It's Jubilee. Guess what Jubilee is? Every 50 years, Israelites were to give back all the land, So all the land would go back to the original owners. Slaves were freed. Captives, people who were in prison, were let out. People who were downtrodden and poor were given, like were reestablished. So you were living on the street, you were given a home and reestablished. Everything kind of reset. And for a year, no one farmed. No one did anything to provide for themselves. It was the year of Jubilee and they had prepared for it every seven years and then on the 50th. Now, there's some argue if it was 49th or 50th. It doesn't matter. Um, right? It really doesn't. But this is what they would do. Now, Jesus reads this, and then he nonchalantly sits down and says, in your hearing, these words have been fulfilled. Well, what was he saying? He was saying, that year of Jubilee, at this very moment, I am ushering in not a year, But the rest of history is now in the year of the Lord's favor. So let's just talk about this year of the Lord's favor, because it starts out as that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, and that I have been anointed too. So God, sovereign, his spirit is on him. There's an anointing, meaning he's been called out to do something. But here's a little twist in all of this. When he started the revolution, and then he died and rose from the dead, 
And when you make that declaration that he's your king, guess what sovereign Lord's spirit is in and on you? The same one that was on and in Jesus in that moment. Like you have the spirit of God. So guess what? You are now part of the revolution. You are part of the alternative kingdom. You are part of something completely different. And here in this passage of Isaiah 61, you are given the first part of what you're to do. The first foundation of the works that have been laid out for you. Because vengeance and favor are the foundations of the home God invites you into. So here's how it works. God has called you to yell a lot and bind. That the first part of Isaiah is actually about yelling. So it says that you should preach, that he's anointed to preach the good news to the poor. That word preach is the same word that he uses later, or continues to use, it's translated proclaim. Okay, So to preach the good news. Preaching is yelling. Now here's why I would say that. The root of this word is where we get the word accost. Okay, so it's not just me yelling like I am now, because I'm pretending like I'm a real preacher, but because it's an accosting of somebody. So it's more me like, Larry! Like, it's like, this is an accost, like, you're up in their face. Now, here's the thing. The word for good news is not the same word in the, in the Greek text. The Hebrew word for good news is where you get the word for big meal, right? So well, this would make sense, to preach the good news or the big meal to who? People who don't get big meals, the poor, right? Now, this this idea is not just poor like you don't have any money. It is poor in everything. Poor in spirit, poor in money, poor in soul, and poor in spirit, all those kinds of things. And there's something about food that no matter what condition you have, though maybe when you're depressed, food doesn't help as much, but food is an amazing elixir is it not (laughs) like a really really good meal can change your mood so the first thing that you and i are called to do is be people who yell to those of us who are poor in spirit that god has a good big meal for us to eat now this is not a a, like a um, stagnant kind of action the beginning the lord's favor this is where we get evangelism from. God, the, the foundation is that you and I are moving somewhere, making a, a, we're yelling, we're like going on the streets, we're everywhere saying, guess what? There is a big meal. That Jesus' people provide a big meal. That there is, and the meal is the good works that God has laid out for us to do in Christ Jesus. So you're moving along and all of a sudden, the second thing it says is you're supposed to bind up the brokenhearted, Right? And it's an interesting picture because the binding is sort of the same words you would use for setting something, right? This is not a fixing the heart. This is not a village-esque thing, okay? This is not you sitting down going, okay, so it sounds to me like you're having a hard time with your husband. So what's the gospel here? Like, what are you believing? What are the lies? No, this is like, you're on the ground. Your heart is broken. We're going to bind you up because we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. We need to get to the meal. We're not there yet, right? This is triage. Living in, the God, in God's favor is triage because guess where the revolution is happening? It's not happening in Disneyland, right? The, well, it may be, but the revolution is happening in a world that's broken, in a world that's leaving more and more and more wounded people, including us, right? So it's a, it's a moving thing. So we're to yell or to bind. So what are some of the other things we're yelling? Well, number one, that there are freedom for the captives and release from darkness, right? That, that we're going to free people from darkness. Now, if you notice, there was a little difference in what Jesus said in Isaiah, when he read Isaiah 61 and when I read it. Well, that's just because most likely it was out of the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And it's in that word, um, darkness, it can you can translate it blind. So it's the same concept. That you're either giving people who are blind sight or you are bringing people out of darkness. Same idea here. We're yelling at people and saying, you got to come out of the darkness. There is freedom for all of the things that have kept you captive. That is what the year of of God's favor is. That's what you and I have come into. That's the hope. 
but there are no results there. Right? There's nothing. That's like that's not fixing anything. It's just announcing. Because in Christianity, one of the good works that you and I have to do is announce. Your job is not to pro- to fix, to change, or convince anyone that they should become a follower of Jesus. Your job is to announce that something good is happening and everyone has an opportunity to be part of it. Because it's powerful, and Paul talks about this all through the New Testament, is that when you and I start speaking about Jesus and what he has to offer, the Spirit does stuff in people's lives. We don't have to do stuff. We just have to announce who God is and what he's doing and invite people into the big meal. But we have to go through vengeance. We cannot make it. This means nothing without vengeance. And so the next line, and Jesus doesn't quote this line, but he also says what, and the vengeance of our God, right? Like somebody, I don't remember exactly how that text says it. But he's talking about God's vengeance, not God's favor. They're lined up. Jesus stops on the favor. Well, why does he stop on the favor? Because the vengeance part hasn't yet happened when he's reading that. So you and I are in Lent. For those of you who don't know what Lent is, it's part of the church calendar and 40 days before Easter. You and I do something very particular. We fast. And in particular, the reason that we fast, and there are lots of reasons, but one of the main reasons is to take something out of our life so that when we touch on it, like wanting to watch TV, eating a chocolate candy bar, skipping a meal, whatever it is, when we have to not do it, we're supposed to reflect on our sin, okay? So our missing the mark, our turning our back towards Jesus, and how that has put Jesus on the cross, okay? So when we're talking about vengeance, the vengeance that's in this particular passage is God's wrath on himself for our sin. Okay. We have to wrestle with that for a moment. The way towards your healing is God's wrath on his son for your healing. God's wrath on himself. He took our consequences. And I said this in the morning service, and I believe this. It does not matter if you believe in Jesus or even that he exists. One thing you understand very clearly is the way to say, stop human suffering, and the way to deal with the brokenness in the world is for all of us to die. We understand intrinsically that death is the solution because we know that there has to be a price Like because we're insane. We're crazy. And we, you know, if you go back into Genesis, there's a guy named Cain. He's the second guy, right? Like he And he's not a good guy. He's a murderer. But before that, God says to him, hey, sin is crouching at your door, basically. Sin is waiting to devour you, and you need to master it. You jump all the way into Romans. This guy who wrote Ephesians that we were just talking about, Paul. Paul says in Romans, I really want to do good, but the sin inside of me does not let me. Like, it is the thing that gets me. Right? The sin... This, this rebellion that you and I have put God on the cross. And God's vengeance is needed. And Jesus experiences it. What does he say on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he feels and experiences both the physical death and the spiritual weight of my sin and your sin and the world's sin and the darkness. Now, the text It's really interesting because these two passages, the favor and vengeance, which are the pillars of basically the new society, all of a sudden, oh, this is, skip that, forget about that. Um, Forget about that for a second. Do I want to forget about that? All right, well, I'm going to forget about that. I was all excited to move to the next thing, but I do want to pause here because here's, here's the thing that happens, is that when we move through this vengeance, when we embrace Christ on the cross, something happens here in church when we gather. And what happens is, and this is the part of the revolution that we're practicing, the favor and the vengeance, like something happens because we live out a future reality in the present, okay? The future reality is a full realization of the gift of mercy from God's sacrifice when he makes all things new. 
The future reality is a full experience of God's favor. But that future reality, you and I are practicing and living out right now as we do the good works of God. And they all culminate around this right here. God's broken body and his blood poured out for us. That's why I had, I didn't say this in the last, in the morning service, but present to the presence, it was a thought I was pondering that I didn't fully develop. So I didn't talk about it in the morning, but since you all saw it, and it's a cool picture, I'll talk about it for just a minute, is that when you and I are practicing and acting out and living out a future reality in the present, what we're doing when we come around the table, when we engage one another, when we eat a meal together, when we sing, when you listen to me and wrestle with things, is that we are trying to be as present to God's presence, to the anointing of God, so that we can hear and interact with one another in a deep and intimate way around the broken body and blood poured out for us, and that when we go into the world, we bring that presence, that awareness that we have thinned the veil a little bit. And so, with that cool picture, we are living a future reality in the present. But, Isaiah 61 makes this transition and, I, and, and invites us into a walking about or a living out. And it's really interesting because the thing he says is that we are to comfort those who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. All right? People who are mourning and grieving are experiencing loss, wrestling with fear, sadness, and depression. Now, let's go back to the beginning of Isaiah 61. People who are in poverty and have been told that they can now have a meal. People who are, who have, this would be you guys and me. So when I'm saying people, don't think it's somebody else, it's us. When we are people, our captivities, like when we are sold, but we're free from being captives, all these things mean loss. All these things mean depression and sadness like we have to wrestle with the reality that we have left right and so we will mourn and we will grieve and life in part of practicing the presence of god part of practicing the future reality in the present is acknowledging that there is pain and suffering and that you and i have to provide a space for that we have to offer comfort for that we have to not quickly fix things Right? And this is what Isaiah 61 says, that when we walk through the favor and vengeance of God, there will be a provision for those who mourn and a comfort for those who mourn and grieve. But then it goes into this bestowing. And here's the cool thing. In ancient times, when you grieved, you didn't get to grieve forever. Right? There was a standard time of grieving, and then the community's job was to invite you out of grief. Right? And here's how we practice the presence of God. This is how we practice the future reality in the present, is that your job and my job is to provide space for people to mourn and then invite them out of mourning. And the way we do that is first, you know, ashes are a form of mourning in ancient times, so we are going to offer beauty instead of ashes. And this is a crown that you would put on someone's head. So the first thing is, instead of not wearing nice clothes and, and being kind of in a state that is, is just kind of down, we invite people to lift their head and we put a crown on their head. Right? That's part of the good works that God's invited us to do. But then we offer them the joy or the, the oil of gladness, right? And really what that is is to say, you are in a safe place. You are saved. Like, you, you have salvation. Like, we are one another's assurance of salvation. The oil of joy is an assurance of salvation. You pour oil over you when you know that you've entered into a safe place and you can smell good and be vulnerable and take a shower and, and be happy and offer praise. So when we think about the good works that God has invited us into, he's invited us to be yellers who offer binding Really what we're doing in that is inviting people into a very deep and rich healing community that allows people to mourn, but also invites them into the joy of who they are and to experience what the rest of Isaiah 61 talks about, but is summarized in the next part, which is that it says that these people, you and I, will be called oaks of righteousness. The first thing, I just thought the life cycle of a bean was cute. Um, 
nothing really to do with Oaks of Righteousness, other than hopefully you have a visual of that. Um, because really, I can't imagine, I've been around big trees, but mostly I feel like a bean. So anyway. Um, but, so maybe we're beans of righteousness. I don't know. But anyway, like, the first thing God does is he names you. And he names you an oak of righteousness. Which is a pretty sweet thing to be named. Like, the, the part of healing, what happens is that you and I, the part of the good works we have is to join Jesus in naming one another to telling one another who we are, that we're named. But not just named, it says that God plants us. right? And here's the cool thing, God plants us, and then we become a display of his splendor. Well, what happens there? That is the picture of a person who is fully living out Isaiah 61, who is telling the poor that there's a big meal, who is offering freedom to captives, who is binding up brokenhearted, who is preparing a space for people to mourn, right? Because what are oaks? They're big, they're safe, and they have nice long branches where people can rest underneath and birds can find safety in the trees. He's, he's offering a metaphor of what you and I have an opportunity to be. Now, I'm not offering you a whole lot of practical things. What I'm offering you is a manifesto for the revolution. Jesus offered us a manifesto for the revolution. He says, everything that you are is Isaiah 61. This is what you're called into. This is what I'm starting. The revolution has begun. You have an opportunity to be part of it. And so, not long ago, I rewrote Isaiah 61, and I would like to read to you my manifesto, along with Jesus' manifesto, for the kingdom, and invite you to be part of it. The Holy Spirit of the Master God is upon me because the in charge has set me apart and equipped me for a special purpose to proclaim, announce, and talk about the good news or the big meal with the mentally destitute, the emotionally distraught, the hungry, and the financially poor. God has directed me, a villager, to care for people who have been destroyed by evil in the world by helping them put their hearts back together. He has also told me to announce the light of Jesus to those who are enslaved by addiction, hatred, and the enemy himself, Satan. I've been instructed to tell everyone that Jesus has come into the world to make all things new, and that he will return to judge all people, to intentionally offer comfort to those who weep because of loss, and to give them a special place in God's kingdom, to continually add beauty where there is sorrow, to offer salvation instead of darkness, and hope to all who are lost. They will be called big, strong trees, telling everyone about the master. What I would like to invite you into is a big adventure. Last two weeks, as we've talked about really hard things, we've given you real practical things to deal with. Ending this series saying, you are part of something that's way bigger than yourself, and it is incredible because it's a whole different kingdom. And it's about every little fiber of your life. But as I said in the beginning, your healing and my healing has to go through God's favor and God's vengeance. And that's what this week, Holy Week, is all about. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to find wholeness in you and to be part of um, your alternative kingdom. Help us to be people of Isaiah 61. Help us to be your children. I ask that in your name. Amen.